Correct, Your Honor. My name is Kyle White. I'm here with co-counsel Thomas Hagler, and we represent the appellant, Sang Zhang. Good morning. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honors. Your Honors, may it please the Court, Ms. Brennan, distinguished among guests, in appellant's brief, Sang Zhang asserts that prior to and during his trial, his Fifth and Sixth Amendment rights were violated. It is appellant's contention that these constitutional infringements flow or merge into each other. The end result is it denied him his right to a fair trial. However, I recognize that this Court has requested that we limit our arguments to those issues presented in Sections 2 through 5. In Section 2 of appellant's brief, the appellant argues that direct questioning of appellant by the District Court regarding his available defenses violated his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination that reached a level of prejudice that now requires a new trial. Prior to trial, the appellant's trial counsel failed to proffer a public authority defense. In fact, prior to trial on a number of occasions, the magistrate and District Court judges had ordered that if the appellant was asserting a public authority defense, it was required to make a proffer consistent with Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 12.3 to establish a prima facie case of public authority. On the first day of trial, the District Court, after having extended the deadline on a number of occasions, reiterated the need for a proffer, specifically stating, I need a proffer. Then trial counsel states that he wants to call the appellant himself to make the proffer, while the trial judge says to this attorney, that's a little unusual. Then the court further stated, I was hoping that you would be prepared to do this today. The defense attorney continues with his statement that he, the appellant, will be making the proffer and testifying based on his belief that what he was doing was actually legal and within the laws of the United States and international law. And yet simultaneously, that same defense attorney is also stating there is no public authority. Seemingly exasperated, the court states to counsel, I need to know, sir, right now, whether you are asserting a public authority defense. Trial counsel permits his client, Sang Zhang, to engage in this colloquy between the court and his unprotected client making the requested and ordered proffer, but through the defendant's own testimony. Jury not present? That's correct, Your Honor. None of this related to the jury, right? The jury was not present. The real problem is a proffer, right? Absence of a proffer? Correct. Thank you. But over the next six pages, Your Honor, the appellant is now being examined and questioned by the court without first having waived his right to remain silent. I know one of the assistant U.S. attorneys recognized the problem and stated very matter-of-factly, my concern here is with the defendant's Fifth Amendment right. I don't believe he's gone through the necessary steps to waive that right. The final question that I think is dispositive or critical is when the court's examining Mr. Zhang without a waiver of rights over those six transcript pages, she finally concluded with nobody from the U.S. government or the United States ever actually authorized the New Hmong country. Defendant answered, no, no, they never authorized. It's your job to fight for it. It didn't say you cannot or you can't. Here the error is prejudice. What's the error that you're alleging by the district court? I know you have complaints about the way the lawyer handled it, but setting that aside, what's the alleged error here by the district court? The more specific error, other than the Fifth Amendment violation, I mean, you can imagine if the defendant was getting ready to testify and prior to the jury coming out did not have a proper waiver of rights, that would be a violation of the Fifth Amendment. And I think the assistant U.S. attorney recognized that and stopped the proceedings after six transcript pages where, in effect, he's waiving his available defenses by the court asking those specific questions. The court is actually engaging in the prosecutorial function of examining the appellant. Now, in Section 3, Your Honor, if I may, the appellant's brief... Just hold on. On that point, you're saying the district court erred by questioning him directly? Yes, Your Honor. And falling into that same category of prejudice is the fact that the court is misapplying the law when it comes to whether he had an actual public authority defense. And specifically, the district court abuses discretion by an erroneous application of the law pertaining to appellant's public authority-related defenses. As the honors are aware, 
There are three government authority defenses, public authority, entrapment by estoppel, and innocent intent. Appellant did not need actual authority to present an entrapment by estoppel defense, nor innocent intent. Entrapment by estoppel has been held to apply when official assures a defendant that certain conduct is legal and defendant reasonably relies on the advice and continues or initiates the conduct. The operative word there, I believe, is continues. And uh, I would argue that the proffer that should have been made is that the right of return here for the Hmong people was something that, that they had been promised, that they would guarantee that if they were displaced, they could return to their homeland. So again, let me interrupt by saying, so what specific evidence of government authority were you present, well, was your client present, prevented from presenting? He, w he was barred from presenting any public authority any defense. And because of the fact that the, def the defense attorney was essentially stating on the eve of trial, we're not asserting any public authority defense and we're leaning toward innocent intent, there were no witnesses available. It was all going to be presented through hearsay evidence through the, the appellant himself. All right. Well, if, that's what, if that was the defendant's position, then what was the district court's error? It seems like you're going back to arguing the lawyer was ineffective. I am, Your Honor, but the Fifth right, Amendment well, violation... Take that up on a collateral proceeding, but we're trying to focus on whether there's any error here by the district court. The district court, in its memo, correctly applied the law in terms of that the, the, the defense did not have to present evidence of public authority in regards to entrapment by estoppel or innocent intent. But when the court is applying that in the, in the, in the, during the proffer, by actually asking the question, what was the actual authori authorized public authority that is uh, providing you uh, evidence, or you have evidence that there was a public authority actually authorizing a new country? I would have framed the, the argument, Your Honor, the question in terms of what the right of return was for the defendant and his people. The, the Hmong had been promised that they would have a right of return to their homeland which is guaranteed by international law. In fact, it dates back to the Magna Carta. There's articles in the United Nations, articles of incorporation that state that individuals, displaced refugees, have a right of return. Then you have uh, the sort of anecdotal stories and specific uh, stories in regard to General Vang Pao being communicated by CIA officials, Colonel Bill Lair and others that the Hmong would be taken care of. If, in fact, something went wrong, they, if they were displaced, they would be taken care of by the United States. They were simply trying to exercise the right of return. Since 1981, General Vang Pao continued to raise monies during that period of time till his death for a purpose of returning to the homeland, to the highlands. It's not a matter of, of creating a new Hmong country. It's the right of the, this particular Hmong community exercising their right to return based on the public authority of not only international law, but also the, the uh, assertions of General Vang Pao and Colonel Bill Lair, as well as the fact that the, the continuing operation of raising funds was occurring from 1981 all the way through hit, uh, General Vang Pao's death in 2011. Then you have specific government officials that defense attorney did not call that were with the State Department, with the White House, with the United Nations that he had communicated with. And of course, none of this was uh, introduced or provided because there was no proffer that was really made in terms of the public authority defense. So bottom line, Your Honors, if I may just uh, sum up and reserve some time. The court, the conclusion of the law that appellant needed actual authority to present either entrapment by estoppel or innocent intent defenses was compounded by counsel's misunderstanding of these three related public authority, government authority defenses. By examining the defendant before he testified without the appropriate waiver of rights, by applying the requirement of actual authority and determining appellant's available defenses and hence limiting his testimony and witnesses that his counsel never called. In essence, presenting no defense now requires a new trial. If I may reserve the remaining time, Your Honor. You may. We'll hear from counsel for the government. Okay. 
Thank you, Your Honors. Good morning. May it please the court. We'll get to this in due time, but in light of our pre-argument instructions to both of you, both your counsel, your client and the Mr. Zong client lawyers, what do you see are the specific questions before us this morning? Your Honor, I see the specific questions before the court. There are two questions related to whether the district court erred in its interpretation of law about what the defendant would have to show in order to assert a public authority defense and the way that information was communicated to the defendant. In other words, whether the district court erroneously precluded the defendant from raising innocent intent. And then the other issue, there's an argument that the sentence was substantively unreasonable. It was a guideline sentence that the district court imposed. And the other argument I think that the court and counsel were just focusing on is whether the district court violated the defendant's Fifth Amendment right by conducting this limited inquiry of him prior to the start of trial to sort of determine whether he was going to assert a public authority defense. Very well, thank you. And so, Your Honor, Your Honors, I think one of the things to really look at at this point is what did the district court actually preclude the defendant from doing at trial? Because I think it is misstated in the appellant's brief. And at the end of this colloquy that happened, and sort of there was this discussion between the parties and the district court had issued an order prior to this colloquy sort of outlining the different showings that would need to be made for either a public authority defense, estoppel by entrapment, or innocent intent. The district court at the end of the colloquy simply prohibited the defendant's counsel from raising the public authority defense in cross-examination or opening statements. And the district court, this is at page 22 of the transcript, volume one. The district court said specifically, you are prohibited from raising the public authority defense. Now the district court had already clearly informed the defendant, if it's innocent intent you're going to raise, there's no showing necessary. You can go ahead and argue innocent intent that you didn't mean to defraud anyone. The district court had also already set forth in its order that in order to, that the defense of estoppel by entrapment was a separate defense than public authority. So the district court was not conflating those terms. And in terms of, I'm sorry, it's entrapment by estoppel, your honor, that was never raised by the defendant below. The defendant never, never indicated that he was going to claim that he was told by someone from the government that his conduct was legal, but that that person was mistaken and that the defendant erroneously relied on that information. So the only thing the district court said was, you can't, you can't indicate, you can't use questioning on cross-examination or in your opening statement indicia that you're asserting that you had public authority. And that's very specific. So if we move on from there, there was no objection at all during any part of the trial to any kind of evidence that the defendant wanted to put in related to his contacts with anyone, his advocacy work, his communications with world officials. There was at no point was there a time when there was evidence that was proffered by the defense where the court precluded that evidence from coming in. So to the extent the defendant is claiming that something happened during the trial that precluded him from asserting his defense, the defendant also, this related issue is whether his right to compulsory process was violated. 
um, because he couldn't put in evidence that he wanted to put in, essentially. But there was no, he never tried to put in evidence of public authority or estoppel by entrapment defenses during trial. There was no objection by the government to anything like that. There was no preclusion at all by the district court on that on that matter. Um, in terms of all of it, from what your opponent said, uh, I don't know if you tried the case. I can't remember from the trial. I did try the case, Your Honor. Um, the government expre itself somehow expressed some concern about the way the manner in which the district court was raising these points. In other words, uh, well, to be frank, uh, did it strike, well, I shouldn't ask you personally, but uh, does it strike one as being a, did it strike us judges as being a bit somewhat unusual for the district court to, to have raised this uh, issue in uh, the district court's own mind? Uh, Your Honor, if you're referencing the, the proffer and the way that sort of came about prior to trial, uh, that the whole well I think the nature of the very fraud in this case sort of begged the question is Mr. Zhang going to claim public authority I mean the the allegations were that Mr. Zhang was telling his followers in the Hmong community that he was working with the CIA with the United Nations with the United States government with the White House and they had given him land in Southeast Asia that he was going to have this country and he was selling memberships in it. So the, the question about is he going to come in here and say, is he going to come into trial and say, yes, I'm working with, you know, so-and-so from the CIA or from the State Department um, and they've told me that this is what I'm getting um, was a natural question to come up. And the defendant below never objected to you know the government. The government requested an initial discovery um, that defendant provide a public authority notice if he was going to assert that defense. The and then the magistrate ordered the defendant to provide that disclosure. It was never provided. So prior to trial, the government raised it again and asked the district court in a motion in limine to require the defendant to provide notice if he was going to use a public authority defense. At no time did the defendant object to the government's request that he provide that notice or say that that was inappropriate. In fact, the defendant seems to agree that he was required to give notice if he was going to assert a public authority.